Hi all, Dr. Clark here again. For lecture, this lecture, we're going to talk about Charles Darwin and what I've kind of deemed his later years. Okay, so this is after Darwin has got married, back from the voyage of the Beagle, has already had a single child, and this is where I think you could say he really starts to become a scientist. Um, and devotes the rest of his life to science. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into it. Basically, where we left off, you know, he was in, on his way or um, becoming a active scientist by publishing material. And so, if we look at some of that, okay. He published. He starts publishing uh, a variety of things, and this is why I said Charles Darwin is more than just an evolutionary biologist. He's that naturalist. He's that ecologist that um, a lot of people's careers are kind of, you know, the baseline of a lot of people's careers. Okay? So he. He published paper on mold formation. He publishes material on geology, uh, so distribution of boulders. He publishes, you know, uh, his works that are most important or most often um, credited to Charles Darwin, and that would be, you know. Descent with Modification or The Origin of a Species. He starts to write on that in 1842. So about seven years or so after he gets back from the Voyage of the Beagle, he's now gave all of his information, all of his fossils, all of his organisms that he collected He's giving it to all the specialists. He's getting notes back from all those specialists on what they were. And he's starting to compile it all. And he starts to write his theory of evolution or descent with modification. In 44, he has a sketch of descent with modification completed. And when we say sketch, we're talking about roughly 400 pages of um, material on evolution or descent with modification. So descent with modification is Darwin's term for evolution. It's not until he reads a little bit of Alfred Russell Wallace's work um, that he starts using the term natural selection. Okay, that's actually, that term natural selection is actually Wallace's term. Okay, prior to that, it was really, Darwin was just using descent with modification. Um, but nonetheless, we give both men credit for the theory of evolution. But you'll see that Darwin had a lot more evidence and he wrote about natural selection or uh, this means of evolution by nature selecting the organism that's best suited. He, Darwin wrote about that way before um, Alfred Russell Wallace did, and that's why he gets most of the credit. Okay, so Darwin at the time asked uh, his wife if she would please set aside money to pay for the publication of this body of work um, if he was to die unexpectedly. And so it was Darwin's wishes to publish Descent with Modification. And we'll talk a little bit about it, but he basically finished the book in 44 and didn't publish it until 59. There are lots of reasons that he may or may not have sat on the book and not finished it. Um, one of the reasons that most com comes up comes up most often is the thought that Darwin knew if he published this work that 
his family would be judged by the church, ridiculed by the church, because a lot of the writings of the, in Descent with Modification was going against the teachings of the church. That, you know, he was saying that species could change and species do change. And he had evidence of that change. He was saying that, saying that all species are connected right, and that they weren't individually created. Right, um, and he questioned quite a bit um, the age of the planet, even though he didn't have a good means to age the planet. He was fairly confident that it was older than the 4,000 or 6,000 years that had been put forth in the 1800s as the age of the planet. So because of those things, um, and then the hint, so he does write a very little bit about human evolution and descent with modification right at the very end of um, the book. He talks about our connection to the great apes. Um, he knew that all of that would make, um, basically make him an outcast in the eyes of the church. Well, his wife, Emma, was um, a devout Christian, and so he really didn't want to cause her any pain or any harm. And that's what a lot of people believe is the reason for him to delay the publication. Um, so... 44 is kind of when he finished The Origins of Species. And then in between that, he started writing other things. He wrote, wrote manuscripts on barnacles and geology. And his father passed away. Now, the other thing that I should state about Charles Darwin is Charles Darwin, when he got back from the voyage of the Beagle, he was sick. And he was constantly sick. Um, he was sick nearly every single day. He had vertigo really bad. Um, and he would, you know, just have spells of, uh, vomiting and whatnot often. And no doctor really knew what was wrong with Dar Darwin at the time, but Darwin missed a lot of things, including his own father's funeral. Um, and part of that was because Dar Darwin was often sick or ill. And other, the other thing was, is Darwin was often uh, wrapped up in his work and, uh, and felt that, you know, his father died and, I mean, his father's dead. So it doesn't really matter if you go to the funeral or not. So there are different differing accounts of why Charles Darwin missed his father's funeral, but some of it suggests that he was ill at the time and couldn't make it to the funeral. Others suggest that he was busy publishing and being a scientist and figured, well, his dad's dead and he's not coming back and there's no reason to go. Um, so, as I said before, Darwin was sick often, um, and so he would try new experimental medicine to see if it would work, and, and we're not entirely sure what was wrong with Darwin, but the, the current, I don't know, I say the current hypotheses out there is that Darwin had Chagas disease, that he was bit by um, a, a bug in South America, and uh, that bug carried Chagas disease. And so if you look at the symptoms that were written about Darwin and Darwin wrote um, on himself, and you look at the region at which Darwin had visited, there's some regions that are notorious for having high accounts of Chagas disease. A lot of people think that that's probably what he had, um, is he was bit, had um, this disease, and it, you know, 
it stayed with him the rest of his life. Regardless, um, he became kind of a hermit, I guess you could say, in the sense that he couldn't go in public very often. He didn't go to pu in, in the public because he would vomit um, or he would have you know, vertigo, he would fall down, he would become very ill, those kind of things. Um, so you'll, you'll see if you read up on Darwin that Darwin didn't, once he published on the origins of the species, he didn't really f do his own fighting um, amongst scientists or against clergymen and things like that. When when uh, he published it, he had other people um, that were friends of his that accepted the theory of evolution and they would battle or do his battling and arguments and and go to talks and and stand up for Darwin's work. Darwin rarely would go to these things um, and definitely not in public because of probably because of his illness. Okay, he finished finally in, in 49 the geology manuscript for the Majesty's Navy. So this is the whole reason why he went on the voyage of the Beagle. Um, so the HMS or His Majesty's ship, um, that's the point of the, the whole voyage was to do the geology of, of the landscape of the continents. And so he finished it in 49. In 51, Charles Darwin's oldest daughter dies um, at the age of 10, and then he finished a um, two-volume book on barnacles. Now, the reason why I bring up his daughter dying is, we'll get to this in a little bit, but Darwin realized later in life that the incestual relationship he had with his cousin, when he married his cousin, caused or may have caused um, illness to his children. And so Darwin used his children as uh, experiments or basically as organisms to study the effects of incest. And um, so he writes about that later on in his life. He'd realized that um, indeed he sees this in such ancestral relationship and the issues that would come with it. Okay? And that was really kind of, I don't want to say the first work um, by anyone on the problems of ancestral relationships, but it was one of the first works and, and definitely one of the first works that had an evolutionary context to it. And that's hugely important from a management point of view because we now know based on genetic work that was the result of Darwin's kind of background, we now know the, the detrimental effects of inbreeding and um, the, the issues that we can have when we have very little genetic stock in a group of organisms. Okay. In 52 and 55, he kept writing different volumes of barnacles and he was doing plant seed experiments. So he was starting to get into genetics and he was trying to do genome experiment experiments, much like Mendel's P experiments. Darwin was working with roses and other plants in the greenhouse to try to figure out heredity, because at the time there was, there was no answer to this, how do organisms inherit uh, their looks or these kind of things. There was, there was no information we didn't know there was genes and we didn't know there was chromosomes and we knew nothing about genetics but darwin was working on that probably well no probably about it at the exact same time that gregor mendel the austrian monk was working on it um they didn't know each other but nonetheless they were both working at the same time 56 through 57 um he put kind of the finishing touches on his natural selection book, uh, The Origin of Species. 
Right? And then it was in 58 that he received the letter from Alfred Russell Wallace, who was in what we call Indonesia now. Um, and uh, he received a letter from Wallace, who was a biologist or naturalist in Indonesia, that basically Wallace's letter kind of spilled out the exact outline of natural selection for Charles, for Darwin. And Darwin wrote, I never saw a more striking coincidence. If Wallace had my sketch written out in 1842, he could not have made a better short abstract. Basically, Charles Darwin was saying, look, I wrote about this exact thing in 1842, and now I'm receiving a letter in 1858 that spills out the exact um, theory of evolution that he was putting put forth in 1842. So <clears throat> in 1858, uh, Charles's baby, Charles, dies of scarlet fever. And at the same time that his uh, son is sick with scarlet fever, Darwin is supposed to go to the Linnaean Society and present his outline of the theory of evolution by means of natural selection. Wallace is supposed to be there presenting his outline of the theory of evolution by means of natural selection. Neither individual show up. So the Linnaean Society, the secretary, read both papers from both men. And so it was Charles Darwin's, or at least it's written that Charles Darwin suggested that the gentleman thing to do was that both individuals would read their papers out, and the Linnaean Society would decide who should go on and publish this material, because both individuals came up with the theory of evolution by means of natural selection. Well, the Linnaean Society, they didn't really care, um, at least what, what's been documented, is there was really little to no response of the papers. They didn't, they didn't really have anything to say about it. So that being said, Charles Darwin in 59 published on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. So when Darwin publishes this, um, you could say that there was a public outcry. Of, of course, you would expect this. Okay. Now, remember, you have to think about 1859. There is no TV, no radio, nothing. The only thing that people have as a source of entertainment is books and other people, you know. But as an individual source of entertainment, it's books. And, and a new book comes out and everyone that had any bit of money um, would buy that book and they'd read that book and they'd give it to, you know, their friends, their neighbors, etc. They'd read the book. Um, so the minute that this is published and it comes out, there's a huge public outcry, mainly from the church, okay? but even from scientists around Europe and around the world, for that matter, that, you know, they were surprised to say the least about this publication and very skeptical. But as time went by, the scientists uh, tended to agree um, for the most part with his Charles Darwin's findings. And in fact, they fact-checked the book quite a bit um, and they would write the individuals that gave Charles Darwin this information. And, it, and once they found out, oh yeah, that individual agrees. Um, the scientific community came around pretty quickly. The religious community and the general public did not come around very quickly um, and wrote lots and lots of cartoons about, you know, the publication and Charles Darwin and himself. And you might expect Charles Darwin to be very depressed because he became the outcast that he 
had expected he would become. The second that he published the book, he knew the church would ridicule him and outcast his family. Um, unfortunately, he was right. They did. So regardless of that, um, Darwin just kept publishing. Um, and he kept publishing things that had to do with evolution, but he also published things that was, you know, you know, just scientific material that added to the scientific community. Uh, articles on climbing plants, articles on um, domestication of animals and plants, and a lot of that domestication publication was about hybridization and inbreeding and the issues that you have with inbreeding. In 71, you know, I, I said this before in The Origins of Species, Darwin barely touches on the link between humans and the great apes. But in 1871, uh, much later, he wrote an entire book that linked humans and the great apes and is called The Descent of Man and the Selection in Relation to Sex. Um, and, and so it is already, you know, he was already ridiculed by the church and by 71, um, people really hated Darwin, um, because of the publications that suggested the link between humans and, and apes. In 72, he published another, uh, book that linked humans and apes, and that was the expression of emotion in man and animals, um, and suggested that, you know, even the chimpanzees and, and monkeys and other uh, apes had the ability to express most of the emotions that humans do, that man does. All right, and he just kept publishing. Um, so 10 years after that, he just kept publishing and publishing lots of different things. Um, sketch of an infant uh, he published his uh bio geographical study of his grandfather lots and lots of publications out there um prolific publisher and um in 82 1882 he passed away in um and is buried in the westminster abbey okay, he was 73 um and here you can see, this is Westminster Abbey, and you can see his gravesite. Right. Now, I, I don't want to say, you know, that Charles Darwin is the reason why we have fisheries and wildlife management. But I would say that he's the reason why we have the scientific process, why we have um, the ability to use the scientific method and as long as a study uses a scientific method then no matter how much ridicule an individual gets as long as the science is sound and it's testable and it's retestable then it will withstand all the ridicule, it will withstand all the politics, it will, it will withstand all the economic outcry, um, and it will live on. And, and I think Charles Darwin's theory of evolution by means of natural selection did just that. I, I mean, I would say 99% of the people on the planet that read his book when it first came out, um, they ridiculed him, questioned him, didn't believe uh, his writing, thought it was fiction, um, etc. And now today, we're not to 99% acceptance of the theory of evolution by means of natural selection, but probably close to 90% of the world accepts the theory of evolution by means of natural selection. And in fact, there has never been a scientific experiment that has gone against the theory of evolution by means of natural selection. So it, it stood the test of time. And, and that's 
you know, that's the piece that I think I want to make sure that all individuals, whether you're going into fisheries management, wildlife management, forest management, rangeland management, whatever it might be, that's the piece that's important is that you're going to make decisions that make people very mad. But as long as those decisions are based on sound science, then it's okay. It's, it's, it's fine. It's the decisions that are not based on sound science. That's, that's going to be when you get in trouble as a manager or as, as an individual in those, in those fields. So what did Darwin not know? Okay. Um, let's look at some of these pieces. First of all, you know, he talked about and he did experiments on that self-fertilization, okay, or the effects of crossing. Again, you know, Darwin realized early on that because he married his first cousin, um, you know, that this was an experiment of inbreeding. And, um, and it, like, you know, like I said before in, in previous lectures, it is very, very common during this time period to marry your cousin. Um, even later on in the 1900s, the early 1900s, it's still very common practice to marry your cousin. It wasn't until the, the mid to late 1900s that it was frowned upon because we learned what kind of um, implications it could have on your children by having such close genetic composition. But like I said before, Darwin realized and he was concerned about his children. He was concerned about the illnesses of his children and he wrote about it. He said, you know, his youngest boy, Charles, who passed away, he was backward in walking and talking, but intelligent and observant. Okay? Um, so Darwin noted that, look, there, there's something going on with my children. Um, you know, Henrietta had a digestive illness. Leonard was rather slow and backward. And, and Horace, okay, he had lots of gasping and shudders and things like that during the day. So probably something like asthma attacks or something along those lines. Um, shivers, grimaces, Elizabeth, okay. George has irregular pulse uh, and a deep flaw in his constitution, okay, and Annie expired at the age of 10. So Darwin realized very early on that it was, it was a mistake to marry and breed with his first cousin was a, a mistake. And he wrote this, this a direct quote from his publication, we are a wretched family and we ought to be exterminated. And it's not because he thought he should kill his children, but um, it, he knew, he noted that, look, I've been mixing and doing self-fertilization experiments with plants and I've been doing it with other animals. And now I can look at my family and I can see some of the problems that we have as a family, as his children have these illnesses and other things that um, can be basically the direct result of inbreeding. All right, so Darwin, again, like I said, you know, he worked on cross fertilization, okay, um, and he noted many things that self fertilization is injurious, okay, so you should crossbreed, um, you should outbreed, etc. It's genetically beneficial. Uh, and he wrote lots of quotes about cross fertilization uh, and um, how important it was to uh, not breed within your family, within your own gene pool. Okay. Um, and, and he even said what's true of the plants that he was working on, it must be applied to the animals and men and women, etc. Okay. So he didn't really know it, but he was doing research on genetics. He was doing research on inbreeding outcomes. Um, 
and he didn't really realize what was going on, but he had an idea of the problem with inbreeding. Okay? He also had no clue about the age of rocks. Okay? So we didn't know how to age rocks. He, did, he made statements that suggested that the planet was older than 4,000 years, 6,000 years old. He said it must be millions of years old. Okay, but he had no evidence to back that up, and that's one of the reasons he was ridiculed quite a bit by the scientific community, at least early on, uh, because he had no way to back up the age of the, the planet. Um, it wasn't until Madame Curie came along in 1903 and 1911, she won the Nobel Prize twice, once in physics, once in chemistry, okay, but it was that you know, discovery of uh, the radioactivity uh, or isotopes and uranium uh, is credited to Madame Curie. She's the one who discovered it, uh, but it was that radioactivity or that radioactive isotope analysis that later came by Rutherford um, that allowed the earth or rocks on the earth to be aged, so the half-life of rocks. Okay, so uh, about 50 years after Darwin's publication, we now know that the Earth is much older than 4,000, 6,000 years old. Okay, heredity. Okay? Again, Darwin was working with the idea of Lamarckian. Okay. And the Lamarckian ideas was that you acquired characteristics and you could pass those acquired character characteristics on to your next generation. Darwin also worked with an idea of, of his own, which he called genuals. So Darwin felt that when um, a man and a, a woman or a male and a female or whatever it might be, when they mated, their gametes or their sperm and egg had little pieces of every one of their organs, a little piece of their hair. So basically, a little chunk of your heart would break off and it would go down into your sperm. A little chunk of your liver would break off and it would go down to your sperm or egg. And then that was passed on. These were called genuals. These little teeny pieces of the individual were being passed on. Okay. And, you know, I don't want to say he was on the right track, but he he was getting there. I mean, he wasn't dead wrong like Lamarckian ideas, but genuals, again, it, it was incorrect. Um, but that's the way they kind of explained heredity during Darwin's time. So Lamarckian ideas was, you know, if you're not familiar with that, that is, you know, if you have a giraffe and the tree branch, is you know tall or than the giraffe the giraffe will just keep stretching its neck until it can reach the tree branch okay and it just eventually become progressively longer okay and that's how a giraffe gets a very long neck okay lamarckian ideas were also suggested that you know if you were a criminal and you stole something and you had your hand cut off then you um, had a child, that your child would be born without a hand. Um, so a lot of these ideas, Lamarckian ideas, were never tested. And when they were tested, obviously, they failed um, experimental tests. But that's what, you know, a lot of the scientific community okay, were basing their ideas around Lamarckian ideas. Um, and then there was a few that were basing their ideas around something like the Genuals ideas, but no one had a good idea of heredity. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, Darwin's first cousin, um, Francis Galton, he's the individual that started epigenics. So it, it was there, it was out there, the information was out there. Um, and I told you that Mendel had published or Mendel was working at the time that Darwin published his theory of evolution by means of natural selection. 
Mendel was working on his P experiments and um, eventually published his material in 1865. Okay? But it was hidden from the scientific community until the 1900s. Mendel's work was. So it wouldn't really matter. Darwin was alive when Mendel published, but no one knew that Mendel published this material until much later in life because um, Mendel published it in a very obscure journal and it sat there and no one read it. All right. So genes and DNA, that wasn't until, you know, much later. Uh, Darwin didn't know anything about genes um, and DNA. He didn't know there was such thing as DNA. In 69, uh, Meister isolated DNA from white blood cells. In 1950, Aaron Shargoff uh, came up with Shargoff's rules, and that was that adenine has to bind to thymine and uh, cytosine binds with guanine, and they have to be equal amounts. Um, and, oh, sorry, <laughs> there it is. So that's Shargoff, Erwin Shargoff. Um, and the number of adenines always equals the number of thymines. The number of guanines always equals cytosines. This is a really important rule uh, because this allowed for uh, James Watson and Francis Crick to discover the structure of DNA by knowing that you always have equal numbers of adenines and thymines and guanines and cytosines and that they only bind with each other, you can discover the, the structure of DNA. So in 53, this, the structure of DNA was discovered um, due mainly in part by Rosalind Franklin, who took a picture of DNA through X-ray diffraction Aaron Shargoff's rule of nitrogenous basing, base pairing, and then Linus Pauling, who um, discovered the helical shape of proteins. Um, really, it's those three that, that laid down the foundation, gave the information enough for Watson and Crick that they're, whoops, they are pictured over here. Okay, with their DNA model. This is Rosalind Franklin. Okay, that's Linus Pauling. Um, there's another individual that won the Nobel Prize with uh, Watson and Crick, and that's his name is Maurice Wilkins. Um, he worked directly with Rosalind Franklin. Rosalind Franklin did not win the Nobel Prize, even though she, she would have if she was still alive. <clears throat> and she passed away prior to the publication of the structure of DNA. Okay, so all the way up to that point, okay, I would argue that Darwin had direct influence on all these scientists because all of them were using the scientific method. None of them were afraid to fail. They failed lots. For example, Linus Pauling, who might be the most decorated scientist, um, he's the only individual to win two Nobel Prizes by himself. Um, he was wrong. He thought DNA was triple helix, okay? And it was him, by, by putting out a publication um, or a memo or something that said, hey, DNA is triple helix, Watson and Crick gravitated on that and said, hey, he's wrong. It's not triple helix, but it is helix. It is a helical shape, and they found out that it was double helix, Okay. And so by by being wrong, it is not a big deal because, you know, he was going out and trying to do experiments and trying to see what would come of those experiments. OK, so that brings me to the link between Charles Darwin and Alba Leopold. So now we're all the way up to the, basically the mid 1900s and we have enough information. We now know how. Organisms inherit their traits. Okay? We now know that you know there's DNA and chromosomes, okay? and that's the kind of the genetic component. And we know that thing species can change, and that nature can act upon species to make them change. And that is enough information for this man, Aldo Leopold, to write the very first game management book, okay? So 
Next lecture, we're going to talk about Aldo Leopold and really the start of fish and wildlife management. And it came at the hands of this individual, Aldo Leopold, using information that really, I would argue, kind of started with Charles Darwin. Okay, so next time, Aldo Leopold.